your Bibles if you want to. Um, appreciate your being here. The, the Lord laid this on my heart, this series, a topic, God's, um, God's design for marriage and the family and human sexuality because uh, in large part of all that's happening in our culture and um, the fact that there is, there is, I believe, a tremendous void of um, spiritual truth, at least in the cultural um, realm, uh, which we would expect, there is a void of scriptural and spiritual truth um, with regards to the discussion. And so as, as a pastor, um, the Word of God speaks to what's happening in our culture. The Word of God speaks to marriage. The Word of God speaks to uh, parenting children. The Word of God speaks to our human sexuality. And, and so just a, just a little disclaimer here at the outset, um, if, if you're fearful uh, that that, you know, I'm, I'm going to say too much. I don't know, I might say too much. Uh, it's certainly not my goal uh, to say too much. I know there are, there are little ears in the room, and um, I, I do not see it as my responsibility to have the talk uh, with your children. Um, I have a hard enough time doing that with my own children, um, let alone taking that on myself for all of your kids. Um, that's your job. Congratulations. I would not want to rob you of that blessing. Um, so, so, you know, where, where we may get into deeper waters, I will give you a disclaimer. And, and really, Pastor Jason and I have talked about this a little bit. As, as we move along, we're going to begin with um, God's, design for, God's design for marriage and parenting. Uh, and then later on in the series, we'll, we'll get into the human sexuality part of it. Um, and so we may have the kids go out um, and, and those times, um, uh, we'll just see how, how that unfolds as we move along. So that's my little disclaimer. At some point, I will put out a table with resources on it, just recommended resources that I have in my office. Maybe Pastor Jason has some in his office that he would want to make you aware of um, that you can uh, purchase for your family that would maybe help you, um, whether, it's, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in parenting, uh, or whether it's in human sexuality and all that is going on in the world and how to, uh, how to have conversations with our children regarding that. And so uh, tonight I want to begin with the question and get our, get our minds thinking a little bit. What are, what are our goals? What are our goals regarding family and marriage? Uh, what, are, what are your goals? Uh, so, so husbands and wives, or if you're... Um, well, well, husbands and wives, what, what are your goals? Have you talked to each other about your goals for your family? Um, and then I would, I would ask the kids, too. Like, like kids, what, what, are, what do you think the goals for your family are? Um, and, and so uh, feel free to respond to me if you, if you have an idea about what some of the goals are for your marriage, for your family. Uh, just, just shout them out. Anybody? Respect. respect. Okay. May or may not have had a conversation today about respect. Faith. What's that? Faith. Faith. Okay. God centered. Okay. Okay. God glorifying. Okay. Tell them the truth. Be truth tellers. Get an amen to that, kids. Amen. 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 John. Lead well. <laughs> yeah, lead well. Lead well. Fun. Say again. Enjoy it. Fun. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, we can have fun. All right, that could be a goal. <laughs> okay, serving together. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there you go. Chores. <laughs> That's fun, right, kids? <laughs> oh man see it's going to take a little work to get some of the some of the young ones on the agenda so what do you suppose <clears throat> I hear you amen what do you suppose are what do you suppose are God's goals husbands and wives what are what are God's goals for your marriage what are God's goals for your family. Die on the cross. Yeah, the Lord did die on the cross, didn't he, buddy? Yeah. 
What else? Unity. Say again. Unity. Unity, okay. Unity. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mutual growth, spiritual growth, right? Good. Sheila? Be helpful, not hurtful. Okay. I mean, I don't know if you've sensed this or not, but it seems, it seems like we, we are more prone to hurt those who are closest to us than even those who are, right, complete strangers. We're often, it's sad to say, but sometimes we're nicer to complete strangers than we are to our husband, our wife, our kids. Um, it's that familiarity, right? Familiar, familiarity. Familiar, that's a hard word to say, but anyway. So I, I want to I just dispel the notion right at the beginning that it's only those verses that actually mention marriage that truly deal with marriage. You get what I'm saying? So I want to dispel that notion. I want to dispel the notion that only the verses that specifically mention parents or children or parenting are the ones that deal with parenting or children or parents. So, so the Bible was not written as a topical index for our problems. Right, so, so I know sometimes we have that approach, and, and sometimes it can be helpful to do that. And, and there are many verses and passages of Scripture that talk about marriage and husband's role, a husband's role and a, a wife's role, and, and um, uh, parents' role, moms and dads, and, and a child's role in the family. Certainly those are all helpful, but, um, but those are not the only Scripture passages that speak to the importance of and God's direction for marriage and parenting, uh, and even as we get into uh, human sexuality. So, so let, me, let me give us a few passage of, passages of Scripture here at the beginning um, that will hopefully prove my point. Uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, this is, this is actually uh, my sermon text for Sunday morning, part of my sermon text for Sunday morning. Uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, what does that verse have to, what, what do those verses have to do with Marriage or parenting? Yeah, okay, we have a calling on our lives. That God has placed a calling on our lives, and we are to walk worthy of that calling. Yeah, so these character qualities are to mark our families, right? Humility, gentleness, uh, patience, bearing up with one another in love. The, the word eager uh, is a very expressive word. Like it is my earnest desire. I am eager to maintain a unity of the spirit, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, okay? How about 1 Peter 1.13? Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What, what does this verse have to do with marriage or family? How could it be applied? It's really easy to lose perspective really quick. Um, you lose the, the gospel focus when our day is a mess. Okay, yeah. So, so having our minds prepared in the Lord to deal with, I mean, we've all been blindsided by problems, right? Um, that 
doesn't, I mean, in my experience, that doesn't often turn out very well. Um, so yeah, if we can prepare our minds, anything else on this verse? I, I, to me, this says that, hey, life is war. Spiritual life is war. Prepare your minds for action. Like, be sober-minded about life. Life is war. Marriage is war. <laughs> Why do we laugh at that? <laughs> Marriage is war. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that here in a few minutes. But parenting is warfare. It's warfare. How many kids in here, would you, would you agree, kids, that it's, that it's hard to be obedient sometimes? <laughs> yeah, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. Look at the hands all over the room. <laughs> oh, Well, let's move on to the next one, just, just the last one here. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Oh, there's, there's something earthly in me. There's something earthly in you that needs to die. It needs to die, over, it needs to die a million deaths, and then a million more, and then a million more after that. Right? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Like, like not, on account of, not on account of what's outside of us is the wrath of God coming, but, but on account of what lives within us, the wrath of God is coming. Right? So put it to death. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeking that you have put off the old man with its practices and have put on the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Right, this says to me this, that, that life is war. That this is put off and put on. That every day we, have, we face the challenges of life. And sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail, right? Um, and so, so if you didn't know it coming in, and I assume you did, okay, and I'm, not, and I'm not trying to belittle anyone, but the Bible is not a topical index where you just look for verses on marriage or husband or, or, or wives or children. Or there's, a, there's a lot of application, to be made from all, all throughout Scripture to our family, our family life. And God aims for us and means for us to do that. And so we begin tonight, we begin our journey with Romans 1.1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Well, what in the world does that have to do with marriage and family? What does that have to do with parenting? What does that have to do with our human sexuality? Well, the word set apart, the word set apart is, the Greek word is aphorizo, which is where we get our, our English word horizon. I think what Paul is saying as he introduces his letter to the Romans is this. God has opened up a new gospel horizon for me. Like the old horizon, the old, the old um, pursuits of Jeff's heart have been washed away in the blood, and there is a new horizon on the landscape, a new, a new world of opportunities to be explored for the glory of God. Does that make sense? And so, so our faith in Christ through the gospel has opened up for us new purpose and new meaning. The pursuit of the old things of my me-centered life has faded, and a new horizon has risen with Christ in the new man that he has created in us. So what does this have to do with marriage, children, and human sexuality? Well, I would simply suggest that it has everything to do with family life 
and everything else in our lives. Life, life itself takes on new purpose and new meaning and Christ-centered value when we put Christ Jesus, we put on Christ Jesus through faith. So in God's design, there are redeeming qualities at work between husbands and wives, between parents and children. Marriage is turf on which husbands and wives are being set apart, sanctified, conformed to the image of Jesus. So, so I would just add here that, that ladies, your husband is God's instrument to conform you one of God's instruments to conform you to the image of Christ. That husbands, our wives, are, are one of God's instruments that he is using, a major instrument to conform us to the image of Christ, to grow us in spiritual maturity, to draw us to himself. Parenting is turf on which moms and dads and children are being set apart, they're being sanctified, conformed to the image of Jesus. So every single day in the families of believers, God's work of redemption, his salvation, his transforming work, molding us and shaping us into the character of Jesus is playing out. So in the walls of our homes and in the, in the family relationships within our families, Discipleship is taking place. Hearts are being conformed to the character of Jesus in real time. Well, like that's happening through a million ways. It's happening in all of our interactions with each other, how we're seeing one another, how we're interrelating, communicating with one another, or how we're not communicating with one another, whatever the case may be. So, so your, your spouse's quirks, your child's stubbornness, the irritations, the frustrations, the joys, the victories, all of it is ground for the God-glorifying, Christ-exalting work of shaping our character to be more like Jesus. So all of it is opportunity for each of us to play out our role and to work the works of God in our lives and in the lives of our family members. So the Apostle Paul was a slave of Christ Jesus, whose eyes were now fixed on Christ and whose heart's purpose was now focused on a new horizon for the gospel of God. In your notes, if, you're take, if you have the notes, the gospel transforms our worldview. What is a worldview? What is a worldview? Very good. <laughs> yeah, it's how we see the world. How do we see the world? Do we, do we see the, because there is a difference. Man, is there a difference. How is it that we live in a culture that has become so increasingly distorted? Where, where our culture has distorted marriage, our culture has distorted parenting, and our culture has distorted human sexuality and sex itself, right? Completely distorted it. They have taken it and they have robbed it from God's designed purposes and they are using it for their own glory. So, so, that, so that marriage and parenting and human sexuality now serves the creature rather than the creator. So, so now, it, now it magnifies the creature rather than the creator, which is what Romans 1 predicts when God gives up a people to their own debased thinking. So all of life takes on new meaning and purpose when our trust is truly in Christ. So when we put on Christ, we begin to see, we begin to, to have our eyes enlightened and opened to God's purposes for all of life. And the family belongs to the Lord, right? 
the family belongs to God. If you're here tonight and you're single, you belong to God. Right? Your singleness, your singleness ought to be used for the glory of God. Uh, married couples, our marriages, our marriage relationships ought to be used for the glory of God. Kids, your design, your design in your family is to bring glory to God. Now, what does that mean? What is, what is glory? What is glory? It's kind of one of those words that we use a lot that it's like, what does glory actually mean? What do you think, bud? What do you think? What is glory? Is that something you shout when you hear the, the pastor makes a good point in church? Glory! Yeah, good. <laughs> Don, what is glory? Yeah, okay. That's glorifying God. Sure. What does the word glory mean? Honor. Yeah, we are giving value. We are, we are showing the value or how much we value or esteem the Lord. When we glorify him, we are saying, God is this important to me. Right? As we set our priorities in life, we, we, make, we make decisions and, and our decisions reflect, okay, how much, how much do we value the Lord versus other things, right? So, so the gospel begins to transform our worldview, and, and so this is a process. So if you take a look at and, and think about your goals what are our goals for our marriage, for our spouse, for our children? What are our goals as we steward our families, as we steward the husband-wife relationship, as we steward the, the parent-child relationship or the child-to-parent relationship, as we steward how God created us as boys and girls, how God created us as men and women, male and female? So, so... So how do our goals measure up in light of the gospel and this chief goal of glorifying God, giving value, showing, showing the great esteem with which we hold God? If my goal is to simply get my child to obey me, now some days that's just survival, right? <laughs> I just want you to obey, right? That's survival. But if, that's, if, if that is my chief goal, well, I'm just suggesting that the gospel should, should be changing that goal, extending it a little higher. That our, that our goal for our children is not just mere outward conformity, outward obedience, but our goal is, as parents, to aim for the child's heart and to... And to point and direct their heart to the Lord Jesus. We can't make our kids believe. I mean, for my, my, if my goal is for my child to become a believer in Jesus Christ, well, well, that's a good goal. But I can't make that happen. I can't save my child's soul. But I sure can point them. I sure can direct them. I sure can do things to aim for the heart of my child to, to, to seek to turn them to faith in Christ. And I can do that. I, the chief way I can do that is by esteeming, highly esteeming God in my life and, and living out in front of them, not just in word, but in deed. I can live out before them that, hey, kids, look at mom and dad. This is how much we value. This is how much we esteem our God. And we're going to live our lives to bring him glory. If my goal is simply my own happiness in marriage, well, that's a self-centered goal, right? I mean, I'm just, I'm just married for me to be happy. Robin, your world just revolves around me. <laughs> she just winked at me. <laughs> so, 
I mean, that, does she? I, I missed it, Brittany. I missed the look. I missed the look. You're probably right. <laughs> but I say there's a higher goal, right? That my chief goal really in, in marriage, if I'm, if I'm focused on giving God the glory, ought to be to see her grow and to see her experience the fullness of joy in her relationship with Christ, right? And not my own happiness. So, so God's chief goal is his own glory. This is not new information to you, okay? You might say, well, why did he start with this? Well, because it's amazing how much I lose sight of this in every area of life. Like God's chief goal is his own glory on display in every marriage, in every child-parent relationship, and in how we steward the family, how we steward our human sexuality. So we are stewards. We're stewards of our marriages. We're stewards of our children. We're stewards of how God has created us. So let's test this against Scripture. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So again, I think that's a verse that, that is a verse about marriage. Where do you see marriage in there? Or parenting? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's in the word whatever. <laughs> whatever you do. I think it's amazing that, that when, Paul, when Paul writes this verse under, of course, divine inspiration, that he uses the most common thing that we do every day. I mean, we love to do it, amen? Eat and drink. He, he takes the most common thing that we do every day, and he says, whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you do, like whatever more you're doing, do it all to the glory of God. Do it all so that the world can see how greatly you esteem, how greatly you value God Almighty. Of what a treasure. Eat and drink as though God is the chief treasure of your heart. Suddenly I'm convicted. <laughs> All those times where I eat uncontrollably, right? So, so, even, even the most basic things that we're doing in life at ground level to survive, to eat and drink, even those things we're doing them to show how great of a treasure God is. Colossians 3.17 is very similar. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Give thanks. Give thanks. Uh, and then Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. So I'll just stop right there. All things were created. That means you and me, we were created by him whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. You were created for Jesus Christ. Your, your marriage and my marriage is for Jesus Christ. Our parenting is for Jesus Christ. Kids, your stewardship in obedience in your family and, and learning obedience is for Jesus Christ. Because it says here, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, first place. That in everything Jesus takes first place. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
So what is happening every day in our homes has everything to do with the glory of God. So we were created for his glory. God has graciously redeemed us through faith in Christ for his glory. We are set apart to do everything for his glory, right down to eating and drinking. We are each one expected by God to make his glory our exclusive goal. So what stands in the way? What stands in the way of our marriages and our families bringing glory to God? What are some of the obstacles that we might face? Our flesh. Yeah, our sinful flesh. I, said, I, I know, I, I, I caught that, but <laughs> we won't leave you hanging out there by yourself. Yeah, our sinful flesh. Or did you want me to say my sinful flesh? <laughs> 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 That's right. What else? What are some of the obstacles that stand in the way of God's glory in our families? <laughs> yes. I'm not going to say that because we're recording and, you know, I'm not going to hang your wife out to dry like that. So, Pride, okay. Pride gets in the way. And how would pride get in the way of bringing glory to God? <laughs> oh, let us count the ways, right? <laughs> Think of other obstacles that would be in the way. Satan. Yeah, Satan. Spiritual warfare. Any others? Fear. Fear of? What's that? Failure. Fear of failure? Temptation. Temptation. Mm hmm. Don? Uh, when kids um, go against me and they are yelling and screaming and hollering and they're bickering at each other. Amen. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> yeah, so all of that all of that sin that we can each bring to the table. Well, I, gave, I I listed a few in your notes here and we'll we'll work through them. A temporal mindset and perspective can stand in the way of bringing glory to God in our marriages. I want what I want right now. I want what I want when I want it. And when I want it, I want it right now. Right? I've sang that song to some, in some, maybe in small group or Sunday school class. I'm not going to sing it tonight. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24 through 34, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about the body, excuse me, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the, field, of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness." And all these things will be added to you. So a temporal mindset, a, a mindset of just where, it could be as simple as where is my next meal coming from. But it, but it streams into all sorts of other worldly things, right? And when, when I say worldly things, I don't necessarily mean sinful things. I mean, I mean things that we care about in this world. 
Some of them we need, some of them we don't need, but we want. But having a temporal mindset can um, detract us from bringing glory to God. Other life agendas, some good goals and possibly some idolatry that exists in our hearts or crops up in our hearts. The consuming desire or expectation to be removed from trial. How many of us as parents say, all I want is some peace and quiet? Right? That, that consuming desire to just, for life to be peaceful. It's not a bad desire. I hope it's not, because I want that. <laughs> I want that. But, but what am I willing to do to get it? Am I willing to sin to get it? Yeah. See, then it becomes an idol. That's right. The answer should be no. <laughs> Papa, I Amen, Jojo. Did you hear that? Josiah said, Pop, pop, idols are not real. <laughs> so true. Maybe it's a lack of true salvation, genuine conversion could be derailing our attempts to bring glory to God. If we're not true, if we're not truly converted to Christ. Now Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 23 speak to that possibility. Now Jesus says there, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many right, mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And there's a passage of scripture that ought to keep us up at night. Right, to stand before Jesus thinking we know him. And the Lord look at us and say, I don't know you. And there's a lot of people in this culture. Like, like seriously, 70, I don't know what the latest statistic is, but the latest one I saw was somewhere near, around 70% of American, Americans say they're, they're believers in Christ. 70%. Our culture, I'm just going to suggest our culture does not reflect that that's true. So, so there's a lot of people who are saying, I know Jesus, but Jesus is saying many, not just some, many will stand before me on that day and I will declare to them, I don't know you. So it could be a, a lack of true salvation or conversion that's keeping us from bringing God glory. Unconfessed sin will hinder our relationship with the Lord for sure. Unconfessed sin. And then, I think this is the final one in your notes. Not seeking after God in a heartfelt way. The Psalms, the Psalms really capture the heart that's seeking God. Psalm 119, verse 10, With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Proverbs eight seventeen. I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently find me. Jeremiah 2.13 speaks to the opposite condition. God says to his people, Israel, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they're idolatrous. And then Revelation 2.5 says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So we, we need to seek the Lord in a heartfelt way. As a husband, I need to seek the Lord in a heartfelt way. As a dad, I need to do that. To truly cultivate a heart that is falling in love with the Lord who loved me so much, the Lord who loved you so much, that he gave his all for us. 
And then to seek to, to value him above everything else in our families. What does that look like? Well, I, I, I believe that's worth a discussion in our families. That it's worth more than just a single discussion. That it's worth an ongoing conversation. Like, okay, what, what, is, what is the husband's role in the family to bring glory to Christ? What is the wife's role? How does that look in your family unit? Kids, what, what is your role in bringing glory to God? What does the Bible say about that? Well, it says, honor your mom and dad. All right? Honor your mom and dad. Respect your mom and dad. Live in reverence of them, fear of them. A healthy respect cultivated and, and combined with love and growing in love, right? Right, I, I've, having raised four kids and now raising two more, I just come to see this, this combination of, of love and respect that, that has, at an early age, I don't know if this was right or not, but at, at, a, at a young age, I almost wanted I wanted my kids to just be afraid of me. Not, not in a fearful way that I, like I was going to hurt them. But then, then as they grow older, you want, you, you don't, you want that, tran, you want that transition to, to more of love, right? Does that make sense? Probably not saying that in the best way. But I think when we discipline our kids, we at least I did, I disciplined differently. Robin and I have disciplined differently when our kids are younger than we did when they were older. Um, and so I think it takes wisdom and discernment to know that and to, to know each of our child's heart because each one is different. And each one responds differently to uh, different forms of discipline and correction, and encouragement. So all that to say that there are some obstacles to, to us bringing glory to God and our families. We'll continue this, this um, line of thinking and study on Sunday night because I want to get into a couple of passages, uh, one in Exodus and one in 2 Corinthians, and so we'll, we'll continue. And I, I did put in your notes uh, some family growth projects. Maybe it was a family just uh, memorize. 2 Corinthians 5.9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Very simple verse. I think even the youngest of children could, could memorize that. Whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please God, to please him. Um, there's some other assignments there that, that you can read through and maybe take home and, and have conversations within your family. Any other thoughts tonight? Comments? None? Jason, you look like you want to say something. Okay. I got you. Okay. Well, let's spend a, let's spend a few minutes in prayer and... Um, if you, we're, we're just going to pray together uh, tonight, but if you have a prayer request, let's, let's spend some time praying about specific prayer requests.